Welcome back to Matt's Movie Nights, uh, where I recommend movies and talk about them. I'm trying something new with the visuals this week, which hopefully will make it look better, but at the same time, I can't see myself, which I usually can. I usually have a little screen where I can see what I'm doing, and I, I can't like this. So, if I seem a little awkward, it's because I can't see myself where I usually can. <laughs> oh, so last time it was a Hammer Horror triple feature. Um, and starting with the classic Curse of Frankenstein, the first Frankenstein film in the Hammer Horror series. Peter Cushing is Dr. Frankenstein, and um, Christopher Lee as the monster. I'm surprised it's taken this long to get to a Christopher Lee movie, honestly. Uh, maybe not that surprising, but the, I don't know. Christopher Lee just seems like an actor who'd have popped up by now. I mean, here he is. Here he is in Curse of Frankenstein. This is a, a very different telling of the uh, Frankenstein story than the the universal version. Uh, in this adaptation of the Frankenstein story, uh, Frankenstein, both of Frankenstein's parents are dead by the time he's like 14 or 15. He's, he's fairly young when they die, and he hires himself a tutor, and his tutor sort of becomes his lab assistant, um, but he's like, this, this is the furthest away you could get from an Igor type. Uh, his, his assistant... Fuck, why can't I remember his assistant's name, actually? Paul. The assistant's name is Paul. Um, and Paul is a very smart person. He teaches Frankenstein, you know, everything he knows. And he's... Sort of like the voice of reason to, to Frankenstein's insanity. Unlike Frankenstein, who's very attached to his experiments, to his creation, uh, Paul is the one who sort of realizes it's a bad idea early on. He, he's for it, like, up to a point. He, he you know, he's, he's with it all the way through the construction and the bringing the monster to life. But then the monster uh, starts doing, like, bad stuff. Um... And, and Paul sort of goes, this is a failed experiment, it's too angry, it's too uncontrollable, you, you're gonna do a lot of damage if you if you go through with this. Where Frankenstein is sort of, no, no, he can be trained, we, we have to get this important scientific knowledge out there, this is so important. Um, he's, he's a lot more actively malicious in this one. Like, Frankenstein's not really a bad guy in, in the... In, in the universal version. He's a little mad, but he's... He never does anything bad or evil in trying to create his monster. Whereas this Frankenstein does. He does a lot of more evil stuff than the original Dr. Frankenstein. Yeah, very interesting, very different retelling of this story. Also, the monster just looks nothing like the the Boris Karloff version. Like, the big flat top neck with bolts Boris Karloff Frankenstein has sort of become the iconic image of Frankenstein. That's what all Frankensteins are based on now. But the monster in this one, uh, as portrayed by Christopher Lee, I think is way creepier. Like, I, I would like to see more Frankensteins inspired by this. Like, Boris, Karloff is in, B Boris Karloff's Frankenstein is intimidating, but this thing is, like, gross. It's, like... Probably what actual dead bodies brought back to life would look like a, a lot more. You know, Boris Karloff's intimidating. This thing is like, oh, ew, oh, mm. 
It's a gross-looking monster, and I love that. I love that it is a gross-looking monster. They make him look a little Boris Karloffy on the the box here, but he, he doesn't he doesn't look that much like the Boris Karloff monster uh, in the movie. That said, um, I mean, I like Christopher Lee as the monster. But also, Christopher Lee is this actor that is just so good. He's just so good. And he doesn't get to do a lot as the monster. Like, he doesn't have any lines. He just, you know, he's moaning and stumbling around. Versus Hammer's take on Dracula, which hmm, either came out the same year or like a year before this. Let me look. Oh, year after this. Year after this, Hammer Horrors Dracula came out. And in in that, Christopher Lee really gets to shine. Because, you know, Dr Dracula's this very dramatic character. And the monster in Frankenstein is not as much. That said, a very, very early Christopher Lee. I don't know how much he had been in before this, but he was not like, a big name when this came out. Um, Hammer's Dracula is kind of what put him on the map. <laughs> so, this was before that. So, uh, Christopher Lee, not not a household name at this point. On, on the back here, one of the quotes they have is, the film that started it all, Christopher Lee. So, you know, I take that how you will. This was also... One of the earliest Hammer horror movies. This might have been Hammer's first production. Don't hold me to that, but it was definitely one of the first Hammer productions. And I gotta say, uh, this is a Warner Brothers archive collection. Warner Brothers owns the rights to most Hammer horror movies here in America. Because they are a British company. Um... Uh, Warner Brothers Archive Collection is not the greatest, because it tends to be, they, they tend to be very plain releases, but this is like a nice two-disc set with a bunch of really good bonus features, so, I don't know, this is a good release, I like this Blu-ray. Sort of coincidentally, I was watching, uh, Stanley Kubrick's Lolita the other day, and they go watch this movie at the drive-in in, in in Lolita, which is kind of weird, because this movie's in color, and Lolita's in black and white. So they go watch this movie, and there's clips of it, and it's in black and white. And I'm like, but that movie's in color. Lolita's not, but this was. 60s was an odd time for color, because, like, half the films were colored, and half the films were black and white. I guess this was the 50s, but, like, late 50s. 50s was kind of an odd time for color, too, but... Mostly, mostly it was black and white through the 50s. Only, like, bigger productions had color. The 60s was sort of a weird mix of both. Before the 70s was just, like... By the 70s, it was a stylistic choice if you did it in black and white. Curse of Frankenstein, it's good. One of one of the best Frankenstein adaptations, honestly. Not, I, I would say not as good as the Universal version. But you know, if you're a if you're a fan of the Universal version, if you're kind of used to the way Universal told the story, I say take take a look at this one because it it does distinguish itself quite well from its predecessor. Both of the other movies we watched were in this Hammer Horror series box set, which is such a weird mishmash of movies. There's a bunch of like sequels in here. Um the Evil of Frankenstein is the one we watched next, which is actually... I, I kind of made a boo-boo here. There was another Hammer Horror Frankenstein that came before Evil of Frankenstein, Frankenstein's Revenge. But by the time I noticed that, I had, I had already finished, like... I had, I had filmed the video, I had finished editing the video, I had finished with the lineup for that movie night... I'm like, it's too late now. I can't put Frankenstein's Revenge in in place of Evils of Frankenstein. So my bad. I skipped a sequel. Um, 
luckily, it doesn't seem like anything too important happened in Frankenstein's Revenge. Although, Curse of Frankenstein ends with Dr. Frankenstein getting executed. He was he he gets he gets his head cut off. He's in a guillotine. Technically, they don't show it. They show the guillotine dropping, but you never see Frankenstein die because it's the 50s and there's a limit on how much gore you can get away with. This is actually really gory for a film from the 50s. Um, which is to say, not very gory, but there's blood in it, which is, is kind of rare for the time period. But he dies at the end of this, but then he's like... He's alive in Evils of Frankenstein, and presumably Frankenstein's Revenge. Maybe they explain that. I will definitely be slotting that into a triple feature in the near future. My bad, y'all. <laughs> but also, also, I just don't have a copy of uh, Frankenstein's Revenge, whereas I do have a copy of Evils of Frankenstein, thanks to this Hammer Horror series set with just... So many random movies on it. It's got like two of the Dracula sequels. Um, I think the reason it's such a mishmash is that this was put out by Universal and not Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers is typically the American distributor for Hammer Horror. So I sort of assume this box set is just all of the ones Universal happens to own. So, Universal put out their box set, and then all the other Hammer Horror movies are from Warner Brothers, who, to my knowledge, have not put out a Hammer Horror box set. Um, Evils of Frankenstein, it's okay. There's stuff I like about it, but it's it's no Curse of Frankenstein. It's, it's not as good as Curse of Frankenstein. That said, it's not as bad as some of the Universal... Frankenstein sequels. It's definitely better than, like, how, uh, uh, Ghost and Son of Frankenstein. I kept calling Ghost of Frankenstein House of Frankenstein last video. My bad. I, I meant Ghost of Frankenstein nearly every time I said House. I think I mentioned House once correctly, and every other time I said House of Frankenstein, I meant Ghost of Frankenstein. It's too many of these damn movies. <laughs> That's... Fucking horror, man. Right from the beginning, right from the beginning, horror movies had too many fucking sequels. <sighs> Evils of Frankenstein. I, I it, There's stuff I like about it, but it's ultimately a, a pretty mediocre movie. Uh, nothing to write home about. I, I don't think it is a necessary viewing, even if you're a fan of the Hammer Horror Frankenstein series. Uh, the monster in this one is not played by Christopher Lee, and he is noticeably more Boris Karloff in this one. Uh, maybe I can find a picture of him in here somewhere? Nah, it doesn't look like it. But you know, I'll, I'll have a picture of the poster of it for the, the intro. There's the poster for it. Ooh, look at that poster. You see how Boris Karloff-y he looks? And he, he looks so much worse than the Boris Karloff one, too, because he's got, like, this giant square foam head, foam forehead attached to his head. Uh, it, it doesn't look good. Definitely not as good as Christopher Lee, and also not as good as the Boris Karloff one, so... But what was the point? Stick with the original design. Maybe it was to disguise the fact that the monster is no longer Christopher Lee. Or maybe it was just because they wanted it to look more like the universal Frankenstein. Like, that is sort of the iconic image of Frankenstein, so maybe they were deliberately shooting for that. Probably. I, one thing I really like about this movie, we see a broke Dr. Frankenstein. He's, he's completely out of money, He's, he's been driven out of town, uh, and, and he's trying to do these experiments, and he can't because he has no money. So he sneaks back into uh, the village from the first movie, 
in an attempt to, like, sneak into his old, the old Frankenstein manor and take a bunch of, like, paintings and jewelry and stuff so he can sell it. Because he's like, I have all these riches out in my mansion that I'm not allowed to go back to. So I think it's nice to see a down-on-his-luck Dr. Frankenstein. That's a, a rarity. Um, and then, of course... He gets back into town and, and all of his stuff is gone because it was all stolen by the Burgermaster. Burgermeister, I don't know, German pronunciation. It was stolen by the cops. The cops took all his stuff. Um, but he does manage to find the monster. Um, and he kind of he kind of has to, like, rebuild it a little. So that's sort of their explanation for why the monster looks different in this one. But he, he can't... He can't get the monster to do anything, but he's he met this hypnotist in town, like, when when he was coming in. Because it's a big festival. He uses this festival as, like, a cover for him and his assistant sneaking in. It's not Paul this time. It's a different guy. Um, he just seems like an intern, honestly. Like, he's, he's just along for the ride. Um, so they sneak in during this festival and they meet this hypnotist. And Frankenstein's like, oh, I'll call up the hypnotist and see if he can get the monster to do something. And so the hypnotist comes and he, uh, you know, hypnotizes the monster, which helps bring it to life. And then he can, like, control the monster. And he, he sort of uses that to his advantage. He's using the monster for, for personal stuff. He, he tells it to, like, go into the village and take any gold it can get. And then he's using it to, like, uh, murder all of the cops who stole Dr. Frankenstein's stuff. And it's weird that it's called The Evil of Frankenstein because I feel like Frankenstein was a lot more evil in Curse of Frankenstein. And this one, the hypnotist, is the bad guy. And that's, that's the plot, just the hypnotist using the monster to his advantage to get whatever he wants. And behind Dr. Frankenstein's back. Yeah, it's it's got its moments for sure. I, I did enjoy parts of it, uh, but I, I don't feel like this is like an essential part of the franchise. Granted, I, I've only seen this and Curse of Frankenstein. I obviously, obviously I skipped the second one, oops, but I, I feel like even regardless of how the second one turns out, you don't really need to watch Evils of Frankenstein, maybe, if you're like, if you really like these movies, if you're a big fan of the, the Hammer Horror ones, it might be worth taking a look at, I, I don't want to discourage people from watching it, it just to me felt like you don't need to watch it. And then the last movie we watched, and probably the best movie in this set, I don't know, I haven't watched all of them, but of the ones I've seen in this set, definitely the best one, uh, Curse of the Werewolf. Actually, the reason I bought this box set, because at the time, there wasn't really a, a good way to get a hold of Curse of the Werewolf. Um, there is now, there's like a Shout Factory release. Um, there's also a Shout Factory release of Evils of Frankenstein, but I wasn't about to put up the money for that. I might put up the money for the Shout Factory release of Curse of the Werewolf. I do like this movie. Uh, Curse of the Werewolf. Only werewolf movie Hammer ever made, but a very good movie. I, I really like it. Um, again, a lot like how uh, Frankenstein, Curse of Frankenstein is a very different telling of the Frankenstein story. Uh, Curse of the Werewolf is a very different telling of the werewolf story. It spends a lot more time on, like, the werewolf's backstory and how he became the werewolf. Which, I could see some people finding it kind of slow, kind of, like, like they wish there was more going on in this movie than all of this werewolf backstory, because he doesn't really become the werewolf until about halfway through. But I really like it. I like how much lore they put into this. You know, 
it's it's also it's a, it's a very Catholic horror movie. Like um, most of the Hammer horror movies kind of are. The Hammer is a very Catholic horror uh, studio, I guess. Very, very Catholic, a lot of their movies. But this one, I feel like more so than most of the others. The werewolf comes to be, there. there's like this old beggar who shows up on the day of, like, uh, the local marquee's wedding. And, uh, he's, he's, like, begging for food and, like, no one has any food. And they're like, if you want food, you should go talk to the marquee, you dumb bitch. Like, like, obviously expecting him not to get anything out of the Marquis, but, uh, the Marquis instead invites him in and sort of uses him as, like, a gesture, as entertainment, like, haha, look at the stupid poor person, let's throw food at him and, and degrade him, um, which upsets, upsets the Marquis's wife a lot, uh, or fiancé. I guess it's his wedding. I guess it's his wife now. I don't know. Um, it upsets her. So then after they're, like, done having fun with him, they just, like, send him off to the dungeon. And, like, no one really takes care of him. There's, like, like, like the Marquis's wife will come by occasionally and and feed him. And then there's, like, a, a housekeeper... Who will come by and feed him eventually, but then uh she gets she gets on the Marquis's bad side, so they throw her in the dungeon with the wild vagrant man, who at this point is like disgusting and unshaven and and very like animalistic. Because part of the part of the when they were making him dance for food, was they made him behave like a, a dog so he's very animalistic he's not all there and so he rapes the lady uh the the housekeeper who gets thrown in with him and then she has a child on the full moon and also on christmas which is like a bad thing like a cursed thing According to the characters in the movie? Is that a cursed thing? I don't think that's a cursed thing, but... They say it's like bad luck for your child to be born on Christmas, because cause that's Jesus' birthday, and you can't take that from him. So... He... Because he's the child of this... Like, wild, crazy... Animalistic vagrant, and... Because he, he, his conception was so violent, and because he was born on this holy day, and under the full moon, he transforms into a werewolf. And, and then they get even a little more extra with the Catholic shit, because not only is it a silver bullet that they use to kill the werewolf, it's a silver bullet that was melted down from a crucifix that was bless blessed by the local bishop. Whew. Try saying that one 12 times fast. Blessed by the local bishop. So it's, it's not even just silver. It's holy silver. A very Catholic, very Catholic horror movie. Um, but a very, very interesting horror movie, like... I, I love how much detail they go into for the werewolf's backstory. Because most werewolf movies, it's just like, the werewolf exists. Like, one of the characters gets bit by a werewolf that was already there. And now they just have to deal with being the werewolf. And this is like, someone who became a werewolf. Perhaps the first werewolf, you know? You could, you could look at this as like a prequel to... All the other werewolf movies. Oliver Reed plays the uh, werewolf, which not a common, uh, not a recurring cast member for Hammer, unfortunately. Um, like Peter Cushing and and uh, 
Christopher Lee, they're in all of these goddamn Hammer Horror movies. But for, for Curse of the Werewolf, they're like, no, nah, let's not go with the guys we always pick. Let's get Oliver Reed. Which, hard to argue with, I love Oliver Reed. He's such a good actor. Like, even, like, late career Oliver Reed, which this was not. This was pretty early Oliver Reed. But even, you get into, like, the late 70s, early 80s, when he's, like, taking whatever movie because he's a fucking alcoholic. And, like, a dangerous alcoholic. And bad someone with a criminal record. Because he got in a bunch of bar fights. Um, even then... He's the best part of some of the movies he's in. <laughs> he's in this goddamn snake movie. Fuck, what's it called? Spasms. Spasms with Peter Fonda. And Peter Fonda's phoning it in. But Oliver Reed's like, nah, I'm giving this dumb snake movie my everything. I love Oliver Reed. He's really good in this movie. Um, one, one of the best Oliver Reed uh, performances... Not, it's not The Devils. I think The Devils is my favorite. But The Devils is also, like, fucking impossible to find. God damn. It, it was on Shudder for a hot minute, and it was on the Criterion channel for a hot minute. And now it's just not on either. God damn, that's a hard movie to find. But it's so good. It's so worth it if you can find it. What more do you say? I, I always have trouble wrapping these things up, because I'm just like... Okay, well, I've run out of things to say. Uh, what more do you say? <laughs> I always say that, just because, like, just, just to, like, reassure myself that I have nothing more to say about this movie. I don't know. It's a good movie. It's a fun movie. I really enjoy Curse of the Werewolf. Uh, highly recommended by me. Um, def definitely one of Hammer's more interesting adaptations. Might be returning to this box set. There's some other interesting stuff in here. I mean, there's there's Dracula sequels in here. And we're definitely going to be watching Hammer Horror's Dracula. Because uh, last time I asked you what your favorite Hammer Horror movie was, and mine is Horrors of Dracula. Or just Dracula, depending on where you are in the world. I don't know which one's which. I know one of them is the British title and one is the American title, but I don't know which one is which. But it goes by both Dracula and Horrors of Dracula. And frankly, I prefer Horrors of Dracula because there's already a movie called Dracula. Like, if you say Dracula, people think you're talking about the, uh, the, the Bela Lugosi movie and not the Christopher Lee movie. Um... And just between you and me, I'm gonna keep this one on the low key. I think Horrors of Dracula is better than the original Dracula. That's just me. I think I think that's the one movie that Hammer did noticeably better than the original. Is is the original Dracula and hor Horrors of Dracula better than than the original Dracula? That's just me though. We'll, we'll definitely talk about Horrors of Dracula. It's coming down the pipeline very soon. Very soon. Okay, technical difficulties with the new recording setup, but to be fair, I thought I lost all of the recording, and instead I just lost, like, the last four or five minutes. So, no big deal, we'll just re-record it. My one answer here is from Lino, who mentions Quatermass in the Pit as his favorite uh, Hammer Horror movie. He also mentions the On the Bus movies, but that's not Ham... It, it was technically put out by Hammer, but it's not Hammer Horror, which I think I specified. Although I might be putting my foot in my mouth with that one. What's, What's your, your favorite, favorite Hammer, Hammer Horror, Horror movie? movie? Very similar question, just, just a different, different studio. studio. What's your favorite Hammer Horror, Horror movie? movie? Yeah, Quatermass in the Pit, great movie. Uh, definitely my favorite of the Quatermass movies. Um, that could be a good triple feature, actually. I still haven't seen the second one, but I'm pretty sure I have all three. So, yeah, Quatermass triple feature, maybe, eventually. Um, I do like Quatermass in the Pit, though, definitely. Definitely a movie worth watching. It's, it's a very, very good movie. He also mentions 
uh, working at a video store, and Barbara Shelley, one of the stars of Quater Mass in the Pit, would come in a lot. Um, and she was, according to him, very nice, always answered his dumb questions about Quater Mass in the Pit, which... Respect. I that's that's really cool. That's really nice. I, I I really like it when you guys come in with like the stories, you know, like oh here's this movie and here's this great story I have attached to it. I, those are my favorite comments. So here we are, uh, the final movie night of the first year of Matt presents. Uh, actually, at the day I am recording this. I, I am recording this on the one-year anniversary of moving into this apartment, and next Friday, so one one week after this video is released, is the anniversary of the very first movie night. So, uh, to commemorate tonight, we have our first guest-curated triple feature from one Mr. Quentin Tarantino. I have right here a Quentin Tarantino triple feature. Not a triple feature of Tarantino movies, a, tr a triple feature of exploitation movies that Quentin Tarantino has put together for us. Uh, starting with The Mighty Peking Man, which is a movie I love dearly, and then uh, Switchblade Sisters and Detroit 9000. Uh, that's going to be our triple feature for next time, as curated by Mr. Quentin Tarantino. So my question for you is, who would you get to guest curate a triple feature? Um, cause I gotta say, Tarantino? Good choice, actually. <laughs> who would you get to, to curate a triple feature? And what movies would you choose if you curated a triple feature? I think I've already asked that one. So, but if you want to answer that today, go right ahead. What three movies would you guest curate? And until next time, have a nice day.